So, continuing with our lecture, uh, so we left off with the Romans having expanded to conquer most of the Mediterranean world, uh, and a major factor, obviously, was that they were a very, uh, very successful militarily. Uh, so Rome's military success, there are a number of factors that uh, help us to understand why they were so good in this, in this regard. Uh, some of which aren't directly related to, uh, you know, like actual battles or military prowess. Uh, so, I mean, but, you know, some is. First of all, the Roman army was fairly large. By the 4th century, uh, the army consisted of four, uh, they broke it down into four legions, each made up of 4,000 to 5,000 men. Uh, and each legion would have about 30 cavalry. Uh, so the vast majority were infantry, foot soldiers, with 30 fighting on horseback. Uh, by the second century, the number of legions would rise to 25. Uh, so as they expanded, uh, obviously there were more uh, people under Roman control. Uh, but uh, the basic idea is you had to be a Roman citizen to actually serve in the Roman army. Uh, so, first of all, at some point they're going to extend citizenship to pretty much anyone on the Italian peninsula, uh, largely in order to ensure that they have the necessary manpower. Uh, but you do have to be a citizen. Uh, but then, you, you know, if you weren't in the Roman army, you might fight, uh, fight alongside the Roman army uh, in a uh, kind of auxiliary capacity, and uh, this could actually be a pathway to citizenship. So this was kind of a way of ensuring the loyalty of non-Romans, uh, whereby uh, eventually loyal allies uh, would be able to improve their, their social and political status uh, within the Roman Empire. A number of other factors. We already talked about how uh, the Romans took losses in stride. Uh, when, they, when they would lose a battle, uh, particularly if, if this became kind of a recurring feature, they would really take a very analytical approach, try to understand what they needed to change, uh, and then you know make the necessary changes, build new armies and fleets, and try again. Uh, they also had a really strong appreciation of logistics. Uh, logistics being the kind of practical concerns that you have to deal with, such as uh, maintaining supply lines, feeding a large number of men and horses, getting armies from one point to another, uh, related to that, for instance, they would build fortified towns at strategic locations as you moved out from Rome. Uh, so these forts, uh, fortified towns, would act as garrisons where you could have soldiers permanently stationed uh, or where they, where they might replenish supplies as they made their way out uh, to another location. Uh, related to this, they built a really impressive network of roads. Uh, and this was primarily for the service of the military, also to m maintain communication so that, you know, the center could get information about what was happening on the periphery and also get orders out there as quickly as possible. Uh, certainly it allowed for the mobilization of military manpower fairly rapidly, particularly if you had to move the army from one point to another uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so the Romans are actually pretty famous for their roads, uh, related to which uh, they were excellent engineers. Many of the roads that they built uh, have survived until today in large measure because they were just so well built. A very famous exam example of this is the Apian Way north of Rome, uh, which you know is kind of a popular kind of tourist thing to do to walk at least part of it. Uh, so you know a lot of these factors explain Rome's military success. Uh, now, culturally, uh, the Romans were heavily influenced by the Greeks, and, you know, again, this doesn't come as a surprise. I think most people are aware of this, you know, even if they don't know a lot about the Romans. Uh, so they were very influenced in particular by Greek philosophy. Uh, Greek rhetoric was very important. Uh, the art of speaking. We might consider what rhetoric is. Today it has kind of a negative connotation. You know, the idea that if someone is good at rhetoric, uh, you know, it's like they're really good at basically BSing, right? Like, you know, uh, it's very different from, uh, we're not talking about the content, you know, the actual uh, content of what someone is saying is more kind of stylistic, that you could be speaking complete nonsense and still be very convincing if you're really good at the art of speaking, good at rhetoric. Uh, now, having said that, back in the Roman period and the Greek period, this was actually considered a uh, very positive value uh, to be good at rhetoric. Uh, and of course, that doesn't mean that you might not be promoting uh, 
uh, something that's valid and legitimate, uh, but you know the idea that you're very convincing. And even today, you know, if you hired a lawyer, obviously you'd want uh, her or him to be very good at rhetoric, right? To be very convincing of a jury, for instance. Now the Romans felt that the Greeks were particularly good at this, uh, but but also with respect to other areas of learning. So they would often, if, if they had the money, you might send your child to study in Athens. Uh, if you couldn't afford to do that, you might acquire a Greek tutor. Now, having said that, there was some resistance. There was kind of the fear that Greek influence would undermine Roman values, particularly in politics. Uh, it's a little bit kind of like, you know, in the United States, if people coming from the country, uh, they want to send their uh, kid to the university in the city, but they're, you know, a bit fearful that in addition to getting a good education, they might kind of lose their small town values kind of thing, right? So that was kind of how uh, sometimes the Romans felt about the Greeks. Now, one uh, kind of area of learning that the Romans are going to be especially famous for is in connection with Roman law. And in fact, uh, many of our ideas about the law come from the Romans. And I'm talking conceptually here, not like about specific laws about, uh, you know, what's considered to be uh, a crime, what the uh, punishment should be, and so forth, but rather how we think about the law. You know, for instance, ideas that, like, that you should be considered innocent until proven guilty. Uh, you know, the, and kind of also procedurally, right, the idea that you have a case, right, and you have to have evidence, you need to construct an argument to demonstrate why you think someone is innocent or guilty, uh, that you need to find, uh, you know, maybe the actual weapon or you need to establish a motive. This kind of approach to the law in many ways reflects Roman influence. Now, Roman law's development began with the 12 tablets of 450 BCE. Uh, when the plebs were trying to establish exactly to what extent they were being discriminated against. Uh, and that would kind of mark the beginning of a process uh, in term, terms of the law's development. Now, it would never be like properly codified, right? Like the sense that uh, you, you'd have uh, all the laws and kind of, you know, how they were interconnected, all laid out on paper and organized in, in a really particular way. Uh, and, and part of this also reflects that as they invented new laws, they never actually abrogated or eliminated old ones, right? So as praetors rendered decisions, uh, edicts, in connection with new legal cases, uh, they would just kind of keep accumulating, uh, you know, the outcome of all these different cases, the different rulings, the different ways in which the law was interpreted, and just kind of keep piling it on. Uh, very often not even thinking about, well, maybe a you know, present-day ruling contradicts how the law was understood in the past and so forth. Uh, and at some point, right, so the praetor is expected to have a kind of expertise, a familiarity with, with the, the workings of the law going back centuries even. Uh, and, you know, also under, understanding uh, proper procedure and so forth. So at some point they're going to need uh, assistance. And we see the development of a kind of profession of law expert, uh, Roman jurists, who provide advice for preparing edicts, uh, but also for defining a, a body of legal principles, right? Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, the way the law works, another example of its influence on us today is very often today a, law, a lawyer will argue on the basis of precedence, right? The, that a current case should be judged a certain way because in the past a similar case was judged in a certain way, right? But of course, in order to be able to uh, argue in that way, you need to be familiar with a large number of past cases to recognize where there, there might be something analogous or comparable with a present one and so forth. Uh, a number of very important principles emerge about how the law should work. Some of this reflects the fact that uh, at some point the Romans are going to have authority over a large number of non-Romans. And for the most part they allowed non-Romans to, uh, to abide by whatever laws they had. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that, that could still be problematic. If you had a case, for instance, involving a Roman and a non-Roman, the question would be, how do you apply the law? And so they started kind of looking for common denominators, right? Kind of recognizing that, uh, you know, many elements of Roman law we, we also find evident in other bodies of law. And then thinking about, in a very careful, analytical way, uh, you know, how to deal with when they contradict and so forth. And they develop what's known as uh, the law of just gentium, the law of nations, right? Which is, again, you know, trying to f kind of organize all the different bodies of laws reflective of Romans and non-Romans and to come up with, with some kind of coherent understanding of how they interrelated. 
And then at some point, they also started applying Greek philosophy to their understanding of the law, kind of recognizing that, well, you know, when you look at all these different bodies of laws, you find certain common elements. It does seem that there's kind of certain universal ideas about right and wrong uh, that we can understand by applying reason, right? So they developed the idea of natural law or jus naturale, right? The idea that there, there's just certain kind of ideas about ethics, right and wrong, uh, you know, how the law should work that are just part of the fabric of the universe. Now, another area of Greek influence is going to be in Roman architecture. Roman art is strongly influenced by the Greeks. Uh, this is a really good example. It's a, a building called the Parthenon in Rome, uh, one which survived largely intact uh, because it had the good fortune of being converted to a church early on. So, you know, uh, many other Roman buildings would be mined for their stone to construct other uh, buildings like cathedrals. Uh, so in any event, right, like I think in the, the front part of the Parthenon, uh, you can clearly see the Greek influence with the columns, the, 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 uh, the kind of triangular pediment on the top and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the back, we find uh, probably the defining feature is the dome, which we're going to look at a little more closely later. That, that kind of uh, reflects more a purely Roman development. They didn't in invent the dome, but they really became good at making it bigger and larger uh, and just more impressive, right? And so in this regard, a lot of it reflected that they were really good engineers, right? Building on a large scale. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, Roman sculpture, uh, sculpture definitely influenced by the Greeks, uh, though tended to be a bit more kind of muscular and uh, usually, so, you know, again, it's realistic, realistic in the sense of getting the human anatomy right, but it's also idealistic in the sense that it's like the perfect human form. Uh, and usually in the Roman case, uh, sculptures were, were designed in order to kind of promote the grandeur of Rome. Uh, and one kind of, you know, talking about their abilities as engineers, we should note, uh, again, not inventing this particular element, but really perfecting it, the arch, right? So they would make some advances where they, they really were able to construct on a larger scale using this particular element. Uh, what we see here is an aqueduct, which would have brought water from one uh, part of the Roman Empire, uh, probably to a city or large urban center. Uh, which, you know, if you think about it, would have gone for, for tens or even hundreds of miles. And so this really also reflects an incredible feat of engineering uh, because, you know, they're basically using gravity to get the water to move. And they really have to, you know, over a long distance, have a, a very perfect uh, idea about exactly what should be the degree of uh, declination so that it, it hits the ground in the right spot. Uh, so, you know, it might not be evident just looking at this one part of it, you know, how difficult that would have been, but, but it's a pretty important development. So I'd like at this point to kind of pick up where we left off with respect to political uh, developments. And you might recall we talked about how at some point the division isn't primarily be between patricians and plebs, uh, though this distinction is still important. Uh, but it's more between wealthy and non-wealthy. And wealthy, uh, the term used to refer to wealthy uh, patricians and wealthy plebs is nobile. Uh, and so by the second century BCE, uh, pretty much if you're not a member of the nobile, which, you know, in a sense, it's not even about individuals, but it's about wealthy and powerful families, uh, whether patrician or pleb, you really couldn't end up having a political role as a magistrate or a senator. And uh, this is what we call oligarchy. Right. So, you know, in a sense, it's not uh, that power is invested in the hands of one powerful family or even two or three. Uh, but but on the basis of wealth, that power kind of moves back and forth between a limited number of really influential families. Uh, and to kind of illustrate that, consider that between the years 233 and 133 BCE, 80 percent of the councils came from the same 26 families. 50% came from only 10 families, right? So that would be kind of like, you know, if today presidents always came from, you know, uh, the Roosevelt, uh, Kennedy, Bush, uh, and Trump families, for instance, right? Oh, and thank God we don't have anything like that. Uh, or, well, okay, let's leave that for now. But in any event, coming back to the Roman period, right? So now we have kind of this group of wealthy families dominating politically. 
and they end up breaking down into two different factions. Uh, one faction known as the Optimates, the other as the Populares. Uh, so the Optimates, and the term means best men, they promoted the idea that this was actually perfectly appropriate, right? That the nobles were best suited for government and should maintain that kind of privileged position politically. The populares, on the other hand, meaning favoring the people, uh, argued that they needed to kind of expand, shall we say, the franchise. Franchise meaning those who can participate politically, in this case, even serving office. And often they uh, would promote their position by appealing to the council of the plebs, uh, which increasingly is, is kind of representing now poorer or non-wealthy plebs. Now, just to be clear, the populares are members of the nobile, right? Uh, and so if one were very cynical, they might say that they're just, uh, you know, kind of taking advantage of this division in order to promote their own individual political positions. Uh, the term we use today that comes from this populist, right? You know, the idea of a political figure who might be very wealthy, uh, but tries to further their political situation by appealing to the masses, if you will. Uh, some would argue, in fact, and, and this isn't even said as a, as a criticism, uh, that Trump uh, basically was a populist, right, by appealing to working class people, miners, and so forth, uh, even though he himself is extremely wealthy. Now, the burning issue of the day at this time was what they call the land problem. Uh, so as the Roman Empire expanded, increasingly you had this kind of situation where soldiers would be <coughs> excuse me, campaigning for several years, unable to return to their farms uh, during the off-season, uh, simply because they were too far afield, and their farms would fall into disrepair, and then they would end up being forced to sell them. Uh, and so you know, much wealthier landed aristocrats would often take advantage uh, and would start to gobble up all these smaller farms to create a smaller number of large estates known as latifundia. Uh, now this was impacting the Roman army, which depended on citizens, but more precisely we should say citizen farmers, uh, many of whom now, being landless uh, and thus having no property, are moving to the larger cities just looking for any kind of work. Uh, and they're really not accessible as kind of a, a pool of manpower for the army. So this is actually beginning to create a problem uh, with recruitment. Uh, but obviously it's also a problem for the people losing their farms. Now, two populares who seek to uh, come up with a solution uh, happen to be brothers, uh, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus, both who, of whom end up uh, serving as tribunes for the plebs, uh, again, they are uh, from the wealthy noble uh, strata, right? But they are populares. They are kind of trying to uh, supposedly promote policy that would benefit uh, non-wealthy plebs, these farmers who are losing their farms. Uh, and what they come up with is pretty straightforward. They basically say that the state, right, the Roman state has to reclaim public land uh, held by large landowners and then redistribute it to these landless farmers, these landless Romans. Uh, you know, this is a kind of policy, for instance, that we saw very frequently uh, in, in parts of South America and the Middle East during the 1950s and 60s, where, you know, you had a small number of large landowners, government would, uh, would reclaim some of that territory and then break it down into smaller parcels and redistribute it. Now, in the Roman case, the, the one problem with this is that the large landowners, many of them serve in the Senate, and they're not happy about this. And in fact, uh, in both cases, uh, Tiberius and Gaius both end up being murdered by members of the Senate. Uh, one of them actually literally beaten to death by chairs in the Senate. Uh, so if you think our Congress uh, can get pretty rough, I suppose it hasn't quite gotten to that point. Well, the next uh, kind of crisis at home is going to be what's known as the Italian or Social War, uh, whereby all Italians are granted citizen citizenship. Uh, and the fellow sent to deal with this militarily, there was kind of an uprising in connection with this, was Lucius Cornelius Sulla, uh, who was appointed council in 88 BCE. Now, he is appointed by the Senate and given command of the war in Asia Minor by the Senate. In the meantime, the council of the plebs appoints Marius to head the same war. Uh, so you basically now you have the Senate supporting one, one individual, one council in his army, council of the plebs supporting another council in his army, uh, to fight the same war. Uh, so the war is actually not going to be directed at the enemy, but it's going to take place between the two of them.
Effectively, we now have a civil war between Marius and Sulla. Sulla emerges victorious, and the Senate proclaims him dictator. Remember, the idea is that someone might be appointed dictator during a time of crisis, uh, and then once having resolved the crisis, would step down. And in fact, Sulla does abide by that. He's, he feels the problem is uh, basically that the uh, institutions related to the plebs have become too powerful. We need to kind of get back to the way things used to be. So he's going to really strengthen the Senate, weaken the tribunes of the plebs, right, hoping to restore the traditional republic, uh, and then steps down, uh, feeling actually quite satisfied that he achieved his goal. But what he really, uh, really achieved was to demonstrate how an army could be used to seize power by someone who is sufficiently ambitious. And that brings us up to exactly such an individual, Julius Caesar, a nephew of Marius by marriage, and an individual who uh, eventually became a very popular spokesman for the Populares. Uh, but, I mean, by this time, it's pretty much been established, right? If you really want to achieve power, you need to get a military command and then ensure that that army is loyal first and foremost to you. Well, Caesar does this. He gains a military command for a campaign in Spain, where he proves successful, uh, and then returns in 60 BCE, where he joins forces with the councils Crassus and Pompey uh, to basically rule the Roman Empire to some degree behind the scenes in a rather informal way, uh, though occasionally one or the other or both would serve as councils. Uh, in any event, collectively, they're often referred to as the first triumvirate. By triumvirate, referring to kind of the fact that there are three of them. Caesar himself is elected council in 59 BCE. So here's the thing about ambitious men. They tend not, not to like to share power. Uh, and so eventually, uh, a little bit down the road, Caesar again takes a military command, this time in Gaul, uh, roughly corresponding to modern-day France, leaving Crassus and Pompey behind as councils. This happens in 55 BCE. Uh, now, Crassus is killed in battle two years later, so that basically leaves Caesar and Pompey, uh, and it very quickly becomes evident that uh, really either one or the other is going to emerge uh, as the sole ruler of Rome. Uh, the Senate is more fearful of Caesar. They actually put their weight behind uh, Pompey. And so eventually Caesar is now returning uh, after being militarily successful in Gaul. Uh, and the Senate calls upon him to lay down his command and return as a private citizen to Rome, right? I mean, in effect, to give up uh, his army is a way of indicating that he is loyal to Rome, uh, meaning loyal to the Senate. Caesar refuses, and on January 10th, 49 BCE, he crosses the Rubicon River and returns to Rome to take command of the city. So here we have a scene of Caesar crossing the Rubicon on that date. Uh, this actually has become kind of an expression in English, right? Uh, when we say that somebody has crossed the Rubicon, we mean basically they have kind of gone beyond the point of return. Uh, you might think about it when you were a child, if your mom said no cookies before dinner. Uh, and so, you know, at some point you kind of reach for the jar, uh, and there's still time to turn back. And then you reach into the jar, you pull out a cookie, there's still time to turn back. And your mom's looking at you like, you know, don't even think it. But when you bite into the cookie, that is where you effectively have crossed the Rubicon. So Treaser is triumphant. Pompey flees to Egypt. Uh, at this point, not part of the Roman Empire, but a client state. Caesar has him killed by the king there. And then Caesar is made dictator for life in 45 BCE. Now, from that point forward, Caesar is, you know, look, it's water under the bridge. Uh, not not going to hold a grudge. Very generous towards those senator, uh, senators who had opposed him. Uh, and looks even set to implement positive reforms that would be to the benefit of Rome. But the senators are having nothing uh, nothing. Uh, of it. In 45 BCE, they kill him uh, in the Senate, uh, stabbing him uh, on the Senate floor. Uh, and basically, they just refuse to submit to his authority. And here we have the death of Caesar in 44 BCE. This actually becomes like a really uh, an event that is very often written about in poetry or depicted uh, in, in art as here. Uh, it's a very important scene in a play by Shakespeare about the life of Caesar and so forth. Uh, now, after the first triumvirate, we're going to have the second triumvirate. Uh, 
so pretty much uh, as soon as Caesar is killed, a new struggle uh, for power ensues, and eventually we have three individuals that come to the forefront who are going to govern jointly, again as a triumvirate consisting of three. These individuals are Caesar's heir and adopted son, Octavian, his ally, ally and assistant, Mark Antony, uh, and finally, Marcus Lepidus, the commander of Caesar's cavalry. Uh, most people are familiar with the first two, not so much with the third one. Uh, and eventually, in fact, it does come down to Oct uh, Octavian and Mark Antony. Now, initially, they, they try to divide the empire between them, but again, uh, ambitious men very rarely settle for uh, kind of sharing power, uh, whatever form it might take. They soon come into conflict. At that point, Antony has allied himself with the Egyptian queen Cleopatra the Seventh, a uh, very famous individual. They've made movies about it, TV programs, so forth. Uh, in the end, though, I suppose she chose the wrong side. The decisive battle is the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE, uh, where uh, Octavian's forces basically smash the army and navy of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, who both flee to Egypt where they commit suicide, and shortly thereafter, Egypt is absorbed into the Roman Empire. Uh, Cleopatra VII, by the way, being the fine, uh, final Hellenistic ruler to fall, and pretty much historians would consider this as marking the turning point from republic to empire. Uh, in the sense now that empire not simply referring to the fact that a tremendous amount of territory was under Roman control, but the form of government that is beginning to emerge. To be clear, the Senate will still be around for a while, but increasingly it becomes clear that it has no power whatsoever, and that power resides in the hands of one individual, uh, who will eventually take the title of emperor.